Thank you and welcome everyone. Thank you for um, paying, you, paying me the respect of uh, according me your attention, your time, the most precious commodity that all of us have. Uh, so as Devyansh was saying, I am, uh, um, you know, uh, basically a career project manager, been doing this for three decades, the last 10 years in agility. And what I'm going to talk about today is something very, uh, very close to my heart because it's something I feel that as agile practitioners, it is, you know, our, our, our sacred duty, if you will, to try and help our clients with. And that is basically uh, happiness at work. So without further ado, I'll draw your attention to um, what I have on the screen here. A little story. So the year is 1956. On a cold spring morning, in a derelict looking building on the outskirts of Leningrad, huge printing presses rumble to life. Their contract today and for this week, hundreds of thousands of large posters, such as this one, claiming the benefits of the new five-year plan that Nikita Khrushchev is enacting. Now, if we look at this poster closely, there is a lot of uh, symbolism in the way it is constructed. Nothing was left, uh, nothing was left to, um, basically to, uh, you know, everything was planned in these posters, just as the five-year plans. For example, the the, uh, the beige area, uh, we don't see the entire poster, but it was a map of the Soviet Union with the major agricultural or industrial output of each nation, of each republic. The flags of all 15 republics are there. But I really, chose this image for one simple reason. Look at, look at the people depicted. Look at the depiction of workers and peasants. What I see, what is depicted here in this, this piece of striking piece of social, socialist realism, I read resolution. I read confidence, health, strength, resolve, uh, again, a sense that, a sense of purpose. You feel that in, in, in such competent, strong hands, the five-year plan can only succeed. What I read here, what I see here, conveyed or attempted to be conveyed is, is agency. It is engagement. We now know today, of course, that the terrible, horrible, sham, that the history of the Soviet Union was in terms of, of human uh, misery. But if we look at the way they were depicting it and the tools they were trying to use to convince their population otherwise, uh, there are some striking lessons which I will be discussing today. And thus the title of today's talk, um, basically the title of today's talk is about employee engagement is an oxymoron. An employee engagement is an oxymoron. I will just, I will, uh, I will describe why I, I am using that description. So let's move on into the content and, and continue to develop our story. Again, as an agile practitioner, I time and time again, when I am reading either blogs or books or doing research, I kept, especially in the last few years, come across this 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 odd statistic. The statistic was, sixty eight percent of people at work are engaged or actively disengaged. Now, the first time I saw it, I didn't think much of it. I said, "Yeah, that sort that tends to trend with what I'm seeing at my, you know." in my practice. When I started digging a bit deeper, first of all, I realized, well, this was a statistic only valid for the United States. And I can tell you as a Canadian uh, that we have, a, as Canadians, we've developed an instinct whenever we see statistics to make sure that they apply to more than the United States because, you know, I'm, apologies to all Americans in, in the audience, but uh, we've, we've grown accustomed to living in the shadow of the U.S. and we've, we have to, we have had to develop coping mechanisms to get out of that shadow. And one of them is to always question two things. Does that statistic include us or the rest of the world? And two, if that, that, that price in dollars, is that US or Canadian? Those are the two things that we tend to check for. 
So I started checking on this number and found that it came from um, Gallup. And what I found out is that the number was not 68%. The number for the world is 85% of adults worldwide are either not engaged in their work or are actively disengaged. Think about that. 85%. Now that is that is a very worrisome. This is a very worrisome number. This is this is huge. So it comes from this this report, State of the Global Workplace. Now Gallup came up with this particular report in 2017, and it was based on aggregate statistics for the years 2014 uh, to 2016. Now, obviously, uh, all the numbers that we'll be dealing with right now will be pre-COVID. Um, and just a disclaimer right now, uh, like most of us, I have no idea, although I, I do have you know, my own theories and everyone has their own theories, but all of our crystal balls are murky as to what the new normal will look like after the current new normal of COVID. I think though it's safe to say that if there is misery job misery, because that's how I describe 85% of people unengaged in the world. If there was job misery before COVID, um, we will bounce back to job misery as you know the first, uh, the, the, the first new normal again. I don't think that there will be, have been a tremendous change. One thing that might have changed was the number of people working from, from home discovering and companies and uh, workers discovering that, you know, at least part of a you know, percentage of workforces around the world, discovering that they can skip the commute and that collaboration is possible with modern tools. And I certainly hope so because the work at home movement, you know, I personally prefer it as do most people who have tried it, reducing traffic and so on. All this to say, I'm dealing in pre-COVID numbers right now and I do not have the pretension of knowing what will happen post-COVID, but we can only assume that to a certain extent it will be a continuation with a difference. <laughs> um, okay, so let's delve into these numbers. Uh, let's pick apart that because that big 85% uh, figure is, is very aggregated, obviously worldwide. By the way, this report is not a six page PDF. This is 217 pages of uh, rather interesting reading, I have to say. It's grim at times, but also hopeful. If we look at this, these are the disaggregated, so by by region, basically. So for example, we can see that South Asia at 14% uh, engaged, 65% not engaged, and 21% actively disengaged. South Asia being a region predominantly India, but including uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, South Asia is very close to the actual world average. Uh, U.S. engagement was actually uh, very high, 33% in 2016. What drags the number down to 31, interestingly enough, is Canada, which is more towards the high end of the European uh, nations at 20-something. Uh, there are numbers available for the U.S. for 2020. I found that, and it's dropped to 31%, the lowest ebb ever recorded. A couple of surprises here. The biggest surprise by far on this particular disaggregated graph is look at Western Europe. Western Europe, which was, you know, which would seem, uh, one would think, uh, one would think that there would be higher engagement. And yet 90% uh, of the workforce of Western Europe is either actively disengaged or at 19% or disengaged at work. Uh, and that includes all of Western Europe, including uh, places like Germany. The highest individual country is Norway at 17%, and the lowest is Italy at 30%. Uh, um, uh, sorry, um, the highest, 30% um, actively disengaged in Italy, 17% highest uh, Norway engagement. And obviously the US numbers higher than, you know, we see higher number, high numbers in Latin America, well, relatively 
of engagement post-Soviet Eurasia is, is, is fairly high at 25. Again, these, are, these numbers are, are relative. I'd like to address with my own theory the disparity between Canada and the US, for example, for a moment. And this will go a long way towards perhaps being one anecdotal explanation for the high US numbers. The US doesn't have um, a monopoly on joy at work, uh, although there may be some large, uh, large internet type players that are present in the US. They're also present in other companies. I have my personal theory as to why, for example, there's a you could, we could be looking at 31% in, uh, 33% in the US and 20% in Canada, 10% in Western Europe. And it's very simple. Of all the industrial countries, the US is where an individual faces the most dismal and bleak prospects in terms of a social security net if that individual were to relinquish his or her full-time employment with benefits. Uh, to put it simply, uh, Americans may very well be afraid of not being engaged because not being engaged means losing your job and losing your job can mean mo losing most of your benefits, uh, including up until Obamacare, most of your health care, for example. So that could be one of the hidden drivers of U.S. engagement is un unfortunately could be could be fear of what happens when you lose social protections. So this is, this, these are the numbers for Gallup. And I started wondering again, as an agile practitioner, have we in our community come across anything orthogonal to this that would, um, would suggest that, you know, there's, there's something, because this, there's something afoot here. There's something wrong between 85, 90% of people disengage. So I did find uh, a couple of things, but uh, the most telling was uh, a series of world surveys carried out by the uh, Business Agility Institute. So these were world surveys, mostly around uh, larger organizations that had started embarked on some, some form of agile or uh, digital transformation. So there were 100 and some companies in 2018 and you know almost 400 by 2020. So I, I thought to myself, well, this might be a good number to, uh, to cross-reference with the, uh, the engagement studies. And what these studies found, well, the findings were, were disappointing, definitely, in all three years. Um, if you look at the way this works out, this is uh, business agility fluency out of a total of, of perhaps 10. Uh, so 4.9 in 2018, 4.4 4 in 2019, 4.8 in 2020. The numbers aren't getting any better. In fact, they're pretty much stable or stable or even got a bit worse in, in, in 2019. So large number of people disengaged, vast majority. Companies trying their best to transform, uh, not doing very well at it year after year after year. What are there some of the, what, I started to ask myself, what could be some of the, what could be some of the problem statements we're, we're looking at here? To my mind, one of the biggest problem states is simply this. The word employee, and this is where we get to the crux of employee engagement being an oxymoron. The origin of the word employee comes from employee to use, um, to use a thing, time, energy, et cetera, to be in the ploy of, to, to be in the service of someone else. To make a long story short, I think that employee engagement is probably an oxymoron because you'll never get engagement by treating people like tools to be used. And obviously there must be a lot of this going on because look at the numbers. And we know this from, from our own careers, from our own experience where you know, we see some great places to work, but we see and we have experienced some not so great places to work. So let's go back a moment. Let's go back to our, to our story of uh, you know the 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 derelict looking uh, printing press near Leningrad in 1956, churning out propaganda posters. And here's more examples of Soviet you know, Soviet era socialist realism. Again, you know, look at the look at the engagement here. Look at the confidence, the resolution, you know, the happiness in the case of the worker on the left. 
uh, the, you know, competence. Um, this is, you know, this is very, you feel that, you know, the, the country is in good hands with these people, right? This, this only elicits smug, smug, wan smiles now as we realize what, you know, the, the, the mess that the Soviet Union was in most cases, despite some successes. But we have to look at, look at which we, we, we just, we just looked at, okay, we don't have the grim reality of, of, of you know, of prison camps. And certainly um, most of the world is not looking at, you know, is not an archipelago, you know, a gulag as was characteristic of the Soviet, you know, Union, especially under Stalin. But if you look at, our attempts, their attempts to create an illusion of engagement and to, to create an engage, illusion of, um, of agency. Um, are we any better? Uh, what I mean by that is these, the people depicted here were doing it for something bigger than themselves. They were supposed to be giving themselves over heart and soul to the progress of the state, the progress of the state that would take care of them. They were asked to uh, feel in, motivated by something external to them. When we ask our own people, for example, when we ask our employees to be motivated by getting the stock, you know, the stock price up, or you know, uh, buying back stock, or getting try to get our employees excited about you know shareholder value or profits or anything external to them. Are we not, to a certain extent, you know, sharing in 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 the delusions of uh, of these Soviet propaganda poster makers? And here's where I use sort of a, a television sitcom dream sequence uh, uh, fade here. All we're missing is the heart music. Let's transform to our modern version of the propaganda poster. You know, this is. Uh, uh, images that I've licensed from Adobe Stock, but you'll recognize this. Any, you know, any one, any, any. We're hiring website has images of people like this, and I apologize in advance if any of your companies happen to have used this precise image. I did not intend it that way. I intended to be as generic as possible. So, apologies in advance if I happen to, by some odd coincidence, use your license the same image as, as you had. So the truth is, although this is what we convey on our on our socialist realistic realistic posters, most of our workplaces today are still uh, bureaucracies, or worse, uh, they've just got you know a, a cooler disguise. Oh, and by the way, just to just to make sure we're keeping up with the times here. But think about it, look at like even look look at the the. the be at the layoffs now, but before the 85% disengaged, you know, did our super cool offices protect us from job misery? Where in that 85% disengaged do workplaces like this, they obviously exist. We've, you know, many of my clients over the years have had offices like this. I'm sure yours have as well. You may work in one, uh, but it could be, a, a, it still could be a tyranny inside, right? The, the experience of working in, in, in a beautiful office does not make it any better when when the owner or the CEO or the is a tyrant, for example. <laughs> Let's look at another uh, another approach here. So from 2012 to about 2020, uh, four of the biggest names in business books to date, four of the biggest thinkers in the, certainly at least the the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and who am I referring to? I'm referring to uh, Gary Hamel, well, Frédéric Ladou being Belgian, uh, maybe not the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, Simon Sinek, uh, Stephen Denning, and uh, yeah, and Gary Hamel. So these six books and many, many other books by them and by other lesser known authors and something struck me because I've I've read all these and I you know I've, I've read actually something like in the past ten years I've read about cl close to 250 books on agility and lean and so on so I'm starting to see patterns of repetition <laughs> um, maybe it's just me but the pattern that I've seen with these these major these big names especially is that 
they have consistently mentioned six companies over and over and over as paragons of good places to work, modern places to work, um, places to work that were empowering and so on. And, and here's that list. Uh, you may recognize some of these companies from your own readings or your own experience. So Bert Sorg, the 8,000 person Dutch uh, nursing um, organization. Uh, Gore, the makers of uh, Gore-Tex and other high-tech materials. The Svenska Handelsbanken, basically were, uh, it's a Swedish bank, but each, there's never been layoffs and each branch is actually super autonomous and uh, uh, like a business in and of itself. Uh, the Morningstar tomato uh, growing and canning facilities down in California, Patagonia, the outdoor uh, equipment store, and of course, Southwest Airlines, a perennial favorite. These six are in all the books. And it got me thinking, and there, you know, the books give a, a couple of other examples, but sure enough, I actually told my, one, my wife once, I'm sorry, a new book. And if they mention Bert Sorg, I'm throwing it across the room. <laughs> and they did mention Bert Sorg. Uh, you know, it's, aren't there others is, is, is my, where are all the good companies? So if four of the biggest names in business books, the four of the biggest thinkers in business can only come up with six names all the time, and a smattering of maybe a dozen smaller players, but the same six keep coming back. Why is that? Well, wait a minute, 85% disengagement. So um, there are others, yes, but how many others across the world? Now, and this just in, by the way, it may not be six anymore. Even as I was putting this presentation together, believe it or not, uh, something happened. So as I was putting this together over the last you know, six or seven weeks, saw a piece of news. Sweden's Handelsbanken to cut 800 jobs, pull out of Asia and Germany. Obviously this is COVID related, but there had never been cuts or layoffs at Handelsbanken. So now, guess what? <laughs> Our list of six is down to five, right? Where are all the fantastic companies? The fantastic large companies, the where are all the teal companies, so to speak, in 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 in, in Lalu's way of putting it. So to me, what what struck what strikes me, and this is going to seem to you as a sort of an odd comparison, but there's always a room for a little humor. It's almost like the Fermi paradox. I don't know if you've heard of the Fermi paradox, but Enrico Fermi, the Italian American physicist, came up with the uh, uh, what, what has been named Fermi's paradox. He said that there's a definite contradiction between the lack of evidence for extraterrestrial civilizations and various high estimates for their probability. And one of those high estimates put forth by, I believe, Carl Sagan, just for the Milky Way, is that should, there should be up to a million, uh, there should be up to a million civilizations in, in the Milky Way alone, anywhere from 100,000 to a million. Um, the, Obviously, the uh, there are negative, there are you know pessimistic numbers as well, but it's a non-zero number. <laughs> Put it that way. So it's like the Fermi paradox. Everybody's talking about these fantastic companies, but they're like extraterrestrials, like UFOs. Basically, we we have proof of maybe five of them. <laughs> so it just hit me that that, that it, it's there, there was a parallel here. Now. In the 217 pages of the Gallup uh, report and Gallup itself, which is a very respected organization, but the Gallup been doing studying work for years, they have uh, gone to great lengths to look for uh, companies that were great workplaces. And they, they have found them over the years. And one of their criteria, oddly enough, and interestingly enough, is the engagement ratio. So they looked for 14 to one. Now that would be a great workplace indeed. And here are some of their recent findings and they're across the world, right? They, they found a real estate organization in China, a semiconductor manufacturer in the Netherlands, a chain of hotels based in, in Mumbai, insurance based in the UK and a, a banking services in Dubai. 
So it's, you know, it's not quite the Fermi paradox. There are good companies out there. There are companies that have that are succeeding in, in engaging their employees. But still, I, I bring you back to that number, 85%. So it's, we're just looking at the 15% here, right? really. So as I continued my, my search to, to understand this, I uh, came across, you know, quite a few books that were helpful. Um, this one, obviously, I, I had to read. I, I couldn't, I could not not read this as part of this preparing for this presentation because of the title. So the truth about employee engagement by none other than Patrick Lencioni, who's written, you know, 11 or 12 books at this point. Uh, he became well known for the five dysfunctions as a team, but he's written a lot of other books since. Um, he came up with basically what he found was there's three causes, three main causes of of job misery. Job misery is what I'm going is the, the is the byword I'm going to be using for the 85% now. So toiling away in anonymity, without any sort of hey how are you, um, definitely leads to to job misery. Feeling that one's work, one's contribution is is irrelevant, obviously a, a big downer as well. And he found one immeasurement as his own made up word, a lack of subjective measurement. So being subjected to the whim of, you know, something you, you could do the same, two people could do the same amount of good work and because of favoritism, one could be better rewarded than the other. Uh, there is no, but the idea here, there's, there's no objective yardstick that people can count on in their workplace, which against which they, they can be measured or which against which they trust that they can be measured. That's the important thing here. Now that I've set the stage, now that I've established that there is job misery out there, how do we, how do we get out of it? How do we go from misery to agency? And what do I mean by agency? Because I've used the word a couple of times so far. The sociological definition, the capacity of human beings to shape the circumstances in which they live. How do we get to agency at work? So I'm just going to uh, bring you through a little history lesson. Uh, and this, these are, this is some work that I had done, a couple of slides that I'd done for a previous presentation, but uh, it presents a model that is, uh, um, all models are, you know, all models are wrong. Some are useful. I find that this, this model is useful. So it's a, it's a superimposition of basically um, Kinevin, uh, with a with a nautilus representing the algorithmic nature of the Fibonacci sequence, just to show algorithmic progression. Now let's start this off by throwing in also Lalu's uh, color progression of organizations. You know, red and amber. Uh, red initially got us out of chaos. Red was when we started organizing into tribes, at the beginning of history. And uh, it's very, very, very much uh, command authority uh, control. And it led into the creation of the first hierarchical organizations, everything from armies to, to, to churches to, to early forms of government. But if we go back historically, we can find that these things are still amongst us because we inherit you know, in our, in our command and control workplaces, Taylorism, you know, scientific management, looking at every breath people take and every move they make is still alive. I've heard of companies that are, and I, this is anecdotal, so I don't have any proof to offer nor any specific companies, but I, we've all probably read now that, you know, there are even companies during COVID now, during the lockdown with people working from home using keystroke loggers. All right, that's the equivalent of the guy in the red, in, in the white coat here, looking over the workers in this imagery. Really, we need to measure the work, the the work, the outcomes, not the, not the actual workers themselves. So, Taylorism led to Fordism because for, from 1919 to 1927, it worked very well because they were producing exactly the same model of car, the model, the Ford Model T. And there was not a 1919 Model T and a 1927 Model T and a 1923 Model T. There was a Model T down to the same nut and bolt for nine years. So moving beyond Amber, we got us to basically the 1950s and 1960s. After the war, basically after World War II, 
orange organizations, which were you know the first attempt at meritocracies, uh, the need to innovate and to have accountability. And they're based upon you know the thinking of, of again three men, a lot of men in this story. Uh, Max Weber, uh, you know, obviously the uh, the inventor of uh, basically of bureaucracy in the turn of the century Germany. Uh, Alfred Sloan, who basically you know made GM take the place of Ford in terms of the, the largest auto manufacturer in the U.S. by breaking things down into silos and stovepipes, you know, Cadillac, Buick, GM, Pontiac, so on, making the business units compete. And Peter Drucker with management by objectives and cascading objectives. And something he, you know, he stated at the end of his life, he, he'd now regretted sort of uh, espousing. But those are the undercurrent of our large orange organizations predicated on performance and where, you know, these are the organizations that although it is possible to, you know, their promotions are possible and so on, there is still a, a whiff of, of bureaucracy and, and rigidity. So we did need to break out of orange at one point if we wanted our society to move forward and have any joy at work. And we tried, we tried very hard and we're still trying with what? With Agile. Right. Agile was meant to break us out of orange, basically. It started, obviously, in IT. Uh, but I like something that Jonathan Smart has, has noticed about um, the idea of starting in small IT and trying to grow to encompass the entire organization from that point of origin. He said, grassroots, grass ceiling. And, and it's so true. We've all observed this, you know, the idea that, for example, small teams can start doing, you know, uh, uh, using an agile framework in one tiny corner of the company and within two years, you know, the CEO is espousing agile. Uh, that hasn't happened very much. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And where agile was pointing was to Lalu's model of green with empowerment, with being driven by values, by having a model where all stakeholders are taken into account. And also if you'll notice right below the green, uh, circle here, we have the uh, the word complex that we have moved, we have crossed over into from the world of complicated, where the you know the Ford T Model T, and to complexity, where emergence is is the key. So, you know, as I, as agile practitioners, you guys know like all of this. I'm just trying to make sure that we're on the same page as we try to use agility and use frameworks to achieve that goal of getting at least to green. Uh, one of the way, recent ways we did it was using frameworks. Unfortunately, what we found 25 years on is that frameworks carry their own iatrogenics. Iatrogenics just being a fancy word for, you know, un, unintended side effects it comes from the medical, from the medical world, like medical iatrogenics of, an, of a surgery or, you know, the side effects of a surgery or atrogenics of a medication. Uh, it, the, the, root, the word at its root means harm from the healer. So there's a lot of harm from the healer in terms of uh, abusing agile frameworks out there where the framework itself becomes the objective. You know, by August of this year, 30% of teams will be using the chosen agile methodology and be reporting higher, for example, velocity. Now that's chasing output, that's chasing uh, agility for agility's sake. It is not uh, achieving the true outcomes that we're hoping for. Now what we need, what we need to get away from job misery and what we need to move towards green is way beyond what a strict adherence to current agile frameworks and methodologies will give us. And the proof is 25 years on, 85% of the world is still completely disengaged. Here are some of the few things that get us to green, some of the practices, some of the outlooks, you know, OKRs, you know, objectives and key results or goal quality metrics, call it what you will. Get rid of immeasurement, make sure that we're measuring things in a quantifiable objective way. Uh, have an aligning narrative. So an aligning narrative basically meaning get everyone behind the same story and have a true North Star. Go by invitation, not infliction. And I think that as practitioners, 
uh, invitation, safety, and transparency go hand in hand because I know, I know that myself in, 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 in my career, I realize now that there have been times where under the guise of working as a quote unquote agile coach, which can sometimes be an oxymoron in and of, in and of itself, I have not uh, been working, I had not been working by invitation and I was not acting as, a, as an inspiration. I was more guilty of doing what I call now a drive-by process infliction. All right, so here, do this, do that, do this, do that, goodbye. All right, that is not coaching <laughs> by a long shot. So that gets us to green, some of these practices, but to get beyond green, and we're gonna see what practice is and what we can expect, we need uh, something very fundamental to be addressed, and that is leadership. Um, this is why grassroots grass ceiling. This is the farthest we can possibly get with a grassroots approach. We can start to create some of this, but we will never achieve full green because green requires post-heroic leadership. This is the words of, of Bill Joyner and Joseph Stevens in Leadership Agility, basically, uh, where leaders no longer see themselves as the heroes saving the day and the only constraint or choke point of decisions, but are there to empower and to provide agency to, to, to the folks working for them. So with them, <laughs> that's the other barrier here. But once we get the first four or five practices going, first four, you know, get that mindset of and achieve some kind of safety, a modicum of safety and transparency, and some post uh, uh, you know, our certain percentage of the leaders thinking post heroically, that's when we can get to all the different practices and uh, mindset issues that bring us into a teal organization that has a better chance of, uh, you know, creating agents of, uh, of creating, you know, job happiness uh, rather than misery. Uh, experimentation, true experimentation, becoming a learning organization, teaming from across the organization, including, you know, control functions, including the business, including, you know, compliance and risk and everyone, uh, a true continuous improvement that again includes the entire organization, uh, skin in the game. So actual feeling of, you know, we're not doing it for the shareholders, we're actually going to have uh, skin in the game either way. And managing our options, being in a position to create and sort and sift and generate plans B, C, D, E, F and through to, through to W and not be on one crash course with failure. That will get us. These are the elements that constitute the agency we need to get from misery to agency. There are obviously nicely, nicely laid out on a model like this. It means, hey, where do I sign up? All right, well, <laughs> obviously our organizations that pass a certain point are all complex adaptive systems, right? So, and they're fractal complex adaptive systems. So, in a fractal complex adaptive system, uh, timing truly can be everything. Uh, large organizations can even evolve slower than the average and CXO tenure. And for change changes, what I'm going to, about to say on this next slide is, is very important. For change changes, be you consultants or be you on the inside. Um, and you know, Seth Golden's The Dip is a really, um, really good little book about this. And something that I had intuitively way before reading it done several times, multiple times, and had the scar tissue to prove it. Uh, for change agents, you may need to know when it's time to quit and move on. What I mean by that is, as a change agent, as an agile practitioner, someone who wants to bring people out of misery and who gets up every morning to get people out of misery and into more job happiness, you can't afford to be embroil yourself in one single battle. View your career as the war and view your objective as making as many people happier as possible and, and creating outcomes that are good for all stakeholders. But if you spend two years in a dead end and you do not pull yourself out of that, you are squandering your own resource, your precious resource of, you know, uh, of helping others. You need to move on. And the fractal complex adaptive system 
and timing. I'm going to show you why in a second. I'm going to illustrate it very simply. Here's your, what I mean by fractal, by the way, is here's a complex adaptive system, a large organization, and these are the parts, the moving parts of the large organization. And if you look at this as the team and management within each of these subsections, right? Look what happens over time. Basically, this is going to be a time-lapse acceleration. Things are always moving, right? So for example, at the top of the house, we have a, a CFO who's very teal and the whole organization is run like that. You know, there's some holdouts and the teams reporting to them, so on. But as people are promoted, as the competition, the job may get some very command control people. Basically, as a change agent, you may sometimes be confronted to what is looks a lot like the staircases in the Harry Potter movies. If you're stuck in the wrong timing somewhere, you could spend up to 18 months, you know, barking up the wrong tree. I have been in a position where I stayed too long somewhere, and when I went away and I came, I looked back, I looked back in just to see what they're up to two years later. Everything that I was trying and that our teams were trying to accomplish had been the timing was right and it got done on its own. I had planted the seed, but I refused to go in, to, to be sucked into it forever. So don't feel bad. If timing is wrong, it's wrong. This is why they tell you in, air, in airplanes, if you want people to continue helping others, right? Put your own mask on first. So exploit the three keys to engagement basically, which is Daniel Pink found were mastery, autonomy, and purpose. Those are the things that we need to move forward with. Gallup itself that makes some recommendations pretty much along those lines in the report, you know, improve productivity by being more employee centered. And that it's not just that. Uh, they, they go through a lot of detail, uh, build strength, uh, strength based workplaces. Don't try and shore up everyone's weaknesses, play to strengths. And managers should focus on coaching and, and intrinsic motivation. And everything we saw in the model earlier. And believe it or not, en engagement has demonstrable as well as intangible benefits, right? You get higher, higher percentages of what you want, like productivity, profitability, and less of what you don't want, like absenteeism, turnover, uh, incidents, et cetera. So it's not just a pie in the sky. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could all sing Kumbaya and be happy? There are practical benefits to it. So to sum it back, to boil it all down in my own words, essentially, uh, it's everyone's job, but especially that of leaders, to create basically safe, well-compensated environments where everyone has skin in the game and a substantial say in how they go about serving a shared, higher purpose. This takes time, and it can't be timed, in fact, because most organizations are fractal, complex, adaptive systems. It may involve moving on or biding your time, but it is good and necessary work, and it's best carried out in small increments. And we've seen... This is not, it's not as if all the tools and practices we need aren't available today. We know how to do this. We're just not doing it enough. Agency comes from everything I discussed on the model. It's right here. And here's a stripped down version. And just to end on a, on a more lyrical note, uh, my, 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 my boiling down tended to be very pragmatic and down to earth. I like the way Gary Hamel summed all this up. It's very, I'll read it to you, it's very, you can almost hear the harps, but it's true. We can dream of organizations that are forever looking forward and jump at every opportunity to better the human condition. We can dream of organizations where individuals ennobled by a sense of mission and unencumbered by bureaucracy rush out eagerly to meet the future. We can dream of organizations where the constituency for the future always outguns the constituency for the past. We can dream of organizations where the drama of renewal occurs without the trauma of a turnaround. And if we're daring and inventive and determined, we can build these organizations. That's what matters now. And that is my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be sauntering on over to the, uh, the networking uh, the networking area if you'd like to ask some questions or otherwise uh, uh, discuss this we'll be there in 15 minutes and should should a lively uh, discussion uh, ensue well we can we can always uh, extend that so thank you very much my email is there look me up on LinkedIn